Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. We can move in. These are our last two sessions of the day. Just a note, uh, at our last, after our last session, which should end at 1750, we'll have about 40 minutes before leaving for the tour. In that time, we're going to uh, do a collective group photo um, near the lobby and uh, some steps in the lobby. So when we leave here at 1750, we'll go and immediately take the photo and, uh, and then be able to. So don't, don't leave right away. Uh, and then we'll reconvene at 6.30 for the tour. Also, if you happen to have an extra responder device, just uh, hold on to that and you can turn it in. We know that somebody left theirs behind and, and needed to pick up another one, so if you happen to have two or see an extra one around you, kind of hold on to that and we'll collect it at the end. And we'll collect all those at the end of the day. So begin with our next session about uh, quality assurance and, and the, the title of external QC and the need for harmonization. We'll do a few questions um, that are mostly opinion questions. Um, it may have some strong wording, but uh, you can um, look at that and, and uh, sort of just answer it as you feel. So opinion, the most critical challenge with external quality assessment is, so just some qualities, just pick one that's the most relevant for you. Most. We have about 10% of you that just don't seem to answer the questions. But, uh, okay, so matrix effect comes up as uh, the main and, uh, and then the fact that not really standardized. Okay. Opinion. It is a problem that EQA programs are often not accredited to international standards. Again, there's no neutral. Twenty percent, a little less than twenty percent are not answering. Okay. Move on. Okay. Mostly agree or strongly agree. It is a problem that EQA programs compare to consensus mean and not to a reference method. This one has a neutral. Mostly agree and strongly agree. The problem with EQA is calculation, the comparison calculation is not expressed as tolerance limits based on clinical needs. Some neutral and uh, mostly agree. And next.
number 66 answered. Okay. Oh, we have more people answering now. Okay, so this one's interesting. Eh. Great. This is coming next. <laughs> right? So we've got just a couple more sessions. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Guillaume Lefebvre uh, from Paris, uh, currently working in a uh, biochemistry lab, member of the uh, French Society of Clinical Biochemistry, um, has long time uh, worked with Biorad in a number of projects, and uh, we're really pleased to have him here and sharing his experience. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleague, first I'd like to thank the organizer of this meeting to give me the opportunity to talk about quality assurance and external QC. And the ter terrific question is need for harmonization. The general background of this topic will be that the result of the same test between different clinical laboratories should be equivalent. But uh, as you know in the survey you just done, guidelines are based on test results from specific laboratory but without considering the possibility of difference between procedures. And the absence of recognition of that result are not anonymized, may lead to erroneous clinical decision. And the only way to try to see the problem is to use external quality controls that allow the state of the art for the test comparison. And external quality in medical laboratories should also include evaluation of method performance, as we see this morning, training, education, and help. As we also know that external assessment of a laboratory and ethical performance, that the proficiency testing or external quality assessment, is performance evaluation according to predefined criteria. This includes qualitative and quantitative tests, and this should be and must be a continuous process through different cycles. For example, UKA is mandatory in France, not only because we are in, in, uh, in, in charge of uh, accreditation labs, but also since uh, many years, uh, this, uh, this is mandatory in France. And as you know, UKA organizer could be medical laboratories of the, of the type of laboratory, including government association, professional organization, regional organization, and so. And it's so important to know that it's an important clue for accreditation bodies. And in the field of accreditation, we all know that uh, the norm ISO 15189 should say that uh, the laboratory shall participate in interlaboratory comparison, such as those organized by external quality assessment scheme. And if not possible, as stated in the, in the other norm uh, the, is uh, interlaboratory comparison is not uh, available, the laboratory must choose a way to do that and to define the criteria of acceptability procedure not otherwise evaluated. In France, the EQK standard on reglementation since 1978, all labs must participate to EQA organized by, uh, originally by a French government organization, which is called ASAPS, but participation of EQ survey organized by regional agency or national or regional agencies are highly recommended. And with lab accreditation, all, all essays realized within a lab must have a corresponding EQA. What are those goals for EQA? First, to demonstrate the mastery of a global quality of result, reveal the defect, allow the laboratory implement corrective measures, Improved indirectly other quality controls, there is an interaction between external QC and internal QC. Make consistent, the first step probably, interlaboratory comparison and results. Another way to see a QA is to eliminate old and poor methods and promote new essays. But it's a long way to go to these goals. And the primary intention of AQ in elaborate medicine shall be to support, in fact, quality improvement of the service provided by participating laboratories for the benefit of patients. This is a typical scheme for external quality survey. This is organized by an organization body, which could be, a, as I said previously, a government or a regional accreditation body. And they send you a sample, or a mix of samples, to a participating laboratory, which back the results 
which must be evaluated of co-condensed to expected results, report expected target values, distribution of results, evaluation of acceptability, and summarize all this data. Furthermore, the lab receives the reports, implement corrective measures, and continue to process for the entire program cycle. So the question of my topic is, what could be harmonized among all this data? First step is harmonization of measurement, that is also called the test. It needs to precisely define the measurement. For most of the tests we talk about this morning and this evening, it's rather easy for cholesterol, triglycerides, etc. But in France and in all our labs, we have many, many different tests, including immunologic tests, which deserve this assumption. So it is easy to test with a single reference procedure and reference measurement, but it's feasible for single analysis, not for global tests, such as the metallurgic test will soon. Will soon, will soon. It's difficult or rather impossible for heterogeneous molecules, complex molecular form, etc. For example, to take the example of a cardiac marker such as brain naturalistic peptide, we only know from recently which forms are circulating. So how can we add pure BNP without knowing exactly what is the circulating form of these uh, molecules? We must also start that improve analytical specificity of the measurement by defining for immunologic test crucial or consensus epitopes. This is a case, for example, in the troponin, where there is a global EFCC and international consensus about a particular sequence within the troponin, which must be recognized by all the tests, including uh, non-official uh, non tests or re non-reference tests. So we are improving specificity by developing new essay on the basis of the new definition of measurement by epitope specificity. We must further improve commutability of reference material, not only using, if possible, the commutable material, I will see, we'll see soon, but in order to quantify, or more exactly to minimize, effect of the manipulation of sample metrics. The concept of procedure commutability is accepted for a little numbers of tests. Uh, we see that if the material is commutable, there is a numeric relationship between the two procedures, the reference one and the test one. And in order to have a selection of QC samples behaving like patient samples. But most of the case, there is no harmonization and uh, reference material behave differently from clinical samples. And this is the case of BNP, for example, as I say previously. So, one topic to be harmonized is the harmonization of target value of Yikiki, because the program organizer must provide a target values. For commutable samples, it's rather simple in principle, since mean or median value of reference method by using certified reference material could be used. But it's also limited to a strict number of tests, and not all the tests within a lab could be, uh, could be commutable. And the, cadre, the target value, sorry, depends on the purity of added material. And once more, the problem is what added to my matrix effect in order to give, to give different concentration for my QC. It also tests the accuracy of device, and the mean and median could be, uh, to, could be chosen like target values. For not commutable samples, the general solution is to use mean or median values of the peer group of or eventually the group of methods for all laboratories. But in this way, you suppose that the, mat the same matrix bias is supposed, and consequently the same results are expressed within the lab or between the labs. And the main, number, the main limit of this test, as you, say, as, you, as you see, is the number of participants, because we have many technologies for the same test, and sometimes it's difficult to have a prerequisite numbers of uh, statical, statistical pertinent number of, uh, of providers. What could be harmonized to? Amonize the same, we could try to harmonize the acceptance criteria for AQ interpretation. Since the program organizer may provide a limit value of a range of acceptable value, uh, this value could be established for each test. 
in terms of precision, considering the state of the art, for example, 20 to 50 percent of laboratory result, such a, uh, such a way is uh, chosen by American or German uh, uh, recommendation. But uh, Yukishim's limits of interpretation may be, in fact, or regulatory, but they are generally wider to identify poor performing labs. Most often statistical, but they rely on the assumption that that measurement procedure is acceptable, but you know better, you, your, your lab is not better than, you, uh, than other one, but you don't know which is right. Or clinical, but based on critical uh, difference uh, that may affect clinical decision, based on biological variation, but rather difficult to implement. One way to solve the problem is to see the um, precision estim estimate by the CVR or bias estimated by the SDI, that is for the CVR, the ratio of the CV lab versus the CV group, and you can choose the CV according to the peer or according to the method. In this case of alkaline phosphatase, the results are rather good. Or the bias could be estimated by the difference of the U mean of the lab versus the mean of the group divided by the standard deviation of the group. Ideally for the two is zero for SDI and one for the CVR. And corrective action could be done if you not fulfill this criteria. Next point is to see that what could be harmonized more. Uh, if we see that harmonization of participant, uh, participation uh, could be interesting, this, uh, because there are several potential problems identified when investigating an acceptable result. And the LSSI guidelines give you some clues to make a failure to examination of your behavior of the sample within the lab. You can make clean see the clinical, clerical errors, for example, we talked about a few minutes ago, mislabeled samples, for methodological problems, problems regarding reagent calibration, etc., equipment problem, prop problem, for example, or technical problems due to personal error, and finally, EQ uh, material problems, for example, the, non the problem of conservative, the problem of sample deterioration, and the, sample, the problem of matrix effects. In fact, with this uh, failure tree, you can monitor trends in result of the time and defend and detection of bias. There are some limitations of a QA from the, from the user and also from the manufacturers. From the user, lab must choose a provider independent for in vitro diagnostic manufacturers. Uh, this is not always possible. We must remember that we realize blind tests, but in fact, we all know that uh, quality control is different from a patient sample, even with the, with the presentation of the kind of sample. We must have an independent treatment and no help or no comparison with your neighbor or your other labs. Iki cannot replace internal, calibration, uh, internal quality control due to majority of low frequency of those tests and delay for interpretation. And finally, a key result is not recommended to modify calibration, and a lab must provide exact data in order to have peer, exact peer, sorry, exact peer values, must provide exact data regarding reagent, calibrator, and equipment. And from the manufacturer point of view, and which is different from the IVD diagnostic, we must provide, an EQ provider must provide exact data about the composition stability of the samples and the calculation of a target value acceptable and the limits also statistical calculation. And furthermore, AQ must be close as possible from clinical sample. What is the evolution of a QA? Accreditation procedure will offer a better comparison and guarantee for quality management, but the core element of UQA are validation of UQ and statistical evaluation. Uh, if we see some examples coming from uh, outside biochemistry, non-biological samples could be promoted, for example, photogram or video, or electronic response, electronic pictures, imitating uh, micro, uh, microscopic view. It could be uh, antagonistic with uh, the, the clues that we must very be near from uh, human samples, but in fact it could be a solution in terms of uh, diffusion of information, for example. 
Finally, my conclusion, the use of external quality evaluation allows the simplest way to compare results between, result, between uh, laboratories. All tests, in, especially in the field of accreditation, what must be realized within laboratory and should have an EQA. Is the EQ program must be realized in the same manner as clinical samples, and harmonization of external QC is a part of a general process which begins this morning with a different talk, where EQC providers and clinical laboratories act to support the progress in quality of the analytical process. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Next is Dr. Piet Mayer, a biochemist specializing in laboratory testing and hemostasis and, and quality related issues. And since 1995, he's the director of the ECAT Foundation, an impartial international EQA provider in the field of hemostasis. In 2010 and 2011, was the president of EQALM, a European organization for EQA providers in laboratory medicine. Welcome, Dr. Mayer. Thank you very much for this introduction and inviting me to this very interesting uh, conference. Um, there is some overlap with, in my presentation with the previous one because I think we struggle both a bit with the question what exactly was mean by external quality assessment need for harmonization. And when I was thinking about my presentation, um, I could speak with you about uh, harmonization of EQA programs, about statistical procedures used by EQA providers, about the samples, about the test results, and probably we can add up a couple of other issues. So at the end I decided, okay, I will spend a few words to all these different aspects and maybe that help a little bit further in the discussion about harmonization. So there will be probably a little bit overlap, but I think I can add up also some uh, new aspects. When we first focus on the EQA programs, if we look to the design of different EQA programs, and how different EQA providers have designed the program, you can observe a lot of uh, differences. For instance, in the frequency of the program, of the surveys, the number of samples they use, sometimes it's only one sample per survey, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's up to ten or whatever, that, and that affect, of course, the manner you evaluate the performance of a laboratory. Also, the performance evaluation, how that is, uh, how that is expressed in the reports, we saw some examples already in the previous presentation. So here, there is already a kind of diversity and probably a need for harmonization. Even in the scope of the EQA programs, is it focused mainly on educational aspects or is it an obligatory program that is driven by some rules from the government? What type of samples are used? Are it patient-based samples? Are it artificial samples? That can bring a lot of differences in, in uh, the EQA programs and we can add up more and more different aspects. So if we look at EQA programs, there, at that level already there is a need for harmonization. And I think an organization like EQALM in Europe can take up this challenge to work on that. We should keep in mind that Nowadays, also, EQA providers have to become accredited according to the ISO 17043 uh, guide, but we should realize that to be accredited is not uh, overcome all these problems of the differences between EQA providers. So we should be careful with thinking that accreditation is a kind of solution for everything. Then about statistical procedures. What kind of statistical procedures are used by the different EQA providers? And if we look into the standard 17043 and the related one on the statistical procedures, there is a nice diagram you can follow what kind of procedures you should use and they depend on if there are reference methods for 
the NLI that is included in your program or not? Should you base your evaluation on consensus values or not? So that introduced already differences in the programs. And we did, within the framework of the equal and, and in the working group of hemostasis, a kind of small project where we provide the data set, the same data set to 10 different EQA providers and look at the different manners they apply for the statistical evaluation. Well, most of them use parametric uh, statistics, but if you look then at the way they look at outliers in the data set, there are different ways they do it. So that shows already that not all the EQA providers treat the data in the same manner. Again, a need probably for harmonization. Also, if we look at acceptance criteria, you see that there is, an, that there is some similarities between the programs, but you see that there are also different uh, specifications used. And you can ask about uh, quite frequently used uh, acceptance criteria in the field of coagulation is the target value, which is mostly the con a consensus value, plus or minus 50%. But where is that based on? Is that evidence-based or is that common practice? Some historical reasons for that. Nobody knows, more or less. What kind of target values are used by the different EQA providers? And here you see that if you add up the differences, you, you get more than 10, 10 EQA providers that were involved in this project. So you see that some providers use multiple uh, manners to calculate the target value. But the most widely used approach in the field of coagulation is the overall consensus value. Uh, and then you can split it up in peer groups, etc., etc. You are all familiar with that. And then a very interesting question was, how many unacceptable results were in this data set? And the data set was about 220 results. And you see that it differs from 5 to 73. So also here in the evaluation and, and, and what is reported to the participants, if their result is acceptable or not, there is a lot of difference. Again, a need for harmonization. Then the next issue I'm showed in my first slide was spent a few words on samples that I used. And I took an example of my own program, a nowadays widely used uh, analyte in the coagulation lab, D-dimer. And um, sometimes we are able to distribute samples that are based really on patient material and sometimes we have to use, uh, it is still plasma based, but then uh, the degradation products are uh, produced ex vivo. So that means that in the plasma there is a clot created and dissolved and then you create in this manner degradation products in the plasma. And what you can observe here that I listed here five of the most widely used uh, methods in our program that when we use patient-based material, that for four out of five, we see quite similar results, but there is one that gave a an, an deviating target. But when we look at the ex vivo sample, we see that three out of five have quite similar results, including that one that had here an outlying target value for the patient-based, and two others have completely different um, different target value. So there is no, let's say, one standard uh, difference in uh, the different type of samples we can use in this survey. So again, a problem, the problem of commutability that was already mentioned a couple of times before. Uh, and uh, it was already mentioned in the previous uh, uh, talk as well. There was last year, I think, a very nice paper in clinical chemistry about very important aspects in EQA where they uh, address 
uh, the issue of commutability of samples. And it was already explained, but I would emphasize that commutability with clinical patient samples is one of the most important concepts affecting the design and interpretation of PT EQA schemes. And probably we can say that it is, it is the most important issue. Especially when we go to the next aspect, and that is uh, when we compare results uh, between methods and uh, also look for uh, differences in methods and the need for harmonization. I will show you a couple of examples of my own program in coagulation. And the one I show here that is protein C, it's a natural inhibitor of the coagulation uh, process which can be measured either by a gromogenic-based uh, method as well as by a clotting-based method. And this was uh, a normal sample we distributed. And if you look uh, uh, at the consensus values for the different methods, for the most widely used methods, you see that it's quite good comparable. At least that does not have, have any clinical impact, dif the differences in the consensus values. And you see that almost all the laboratories um, uh, recognize this as a normal sample. You see also in, in the field of coagulation, these are low between laboratory CVs, I can tell you. If we go then for the same analyte, protein C, but now measured by clotting uh, activity, you see some wider range in the consensus values and you observe also uh, some higher between laboratory CV. And that has to do that the clotting test is more complex than the chromogenic test. But even here, although it is a little bit wider range in consensus value, quite good comparable. At least in, let's say, in the field of coagulation, we are quite happy with this. Then another issue, you have to realize that this is a small program, but I would like to show this as an example pi-1 antigen, so this is an immunological test for an inhibitor of the fibrinolysis process, the process that dissolves uh, fibrin clots in, in the blood. And what you see here for the consensus values that differs uh, about five times. So here there is really a lot of differences between the methods that are used in, in the laboratory. And even when you, uh, we, we know that from special projects we run in the past, when you have more uh, participants in, in this kind of uh, projects, you see the differences between uh, the methods. So here there is really a lack of standardization. There is one particular coagulation assay. We think that it is the best standardized coagulation assay, and that is the prothrombin time. If you measure the prothrombin time, you get a wide variation in the exact clotting time that is measured. So if you express it in seconds, then you see a lot of differences between the methods. But they found a manner to harmonize that differences, and that is called the International Normalized Ratio, well known as the INR, and that is a classical laboratory parameter for monitoring of anticoagulation therapy, you probably all know. And um, this harmonization includes that you refer your patient PT measurement according to uh, a mean uh, normal PT, so that that is of a group of healthy volunteers, you measure the average PT, and uh, you include the so-called international sensitivity index, and that includes the sensitivity of the PT reagents to the different uh, clotting factors. So we think with this manner that we make prothrombin time measurement comparable between laboratories and also between uh, different reagents. Well, there was one study that compared uh, uh, real clinical samples with 80 different instrument reagent combinations. So here you have the samples, and each dot, colored dot, indicate a specific reagent, uh, reagent uh, equipment combination. And there are examples within some 
clinical samples that there is a difference between these combinations of an INR of up to 2.5. And if you keep in mind that a an, an difference in INR of 0.5 is decided as be clinical relevant, you can imagine that we cannot speak about standardization or even harmonization for the proton in time as well, although we think it is standardized. We have to realize that APTT and PT uh, are global assays. It does not represent a single analyte, but it represents a kind of test system. You try to mimic in your, uh, in your assay system the clotting process. So it, that depends strongly on the test conditions chosen. It depends also very much on the reagent sensitivity to these individual clotting factors. So to my opinion, by definition, global assays can never be standardized. And it will be even hard to, uh, to harmonize them. Although there are several uh, uh, possibilities and, and, and progress made in that, but as I showed also for the PT, uh, it is uh, not, let's say, the end of the story. So with these examples, I show that, that, um, that on one hand, uh, we have can obtain comparable results also in the EQA programs, but there are also a lot of differences. And I think EQA can play an important role in, rec in the recognition where there is a need for harmonization. About one and a half year ago, almost two years ago, the AACC take the opportunity to organize a conference and to focus on uh, the harmonization uh, of uh, laboratory methods in, in, uh, in clinical laboratory measurement procedures. And last year there was uh, a nice uh, publication on the roadmap for this harmonization, uh, which uh, show uh, on one hand, let's say, the organizational concept, how we can reach uh, harmonization, as well as what kind of aspects uh, from an analytical point of view should be included in this process. And I think this is a very nice uh, initiative uh, and to come to certain criteria uh, how harmonization can be reached, uh, this, this includes uh, clinical outcome, uh, also clinical opinion, val uh, validated data from that biological variation, uh, also, what kind of disease status we looked at, uh, professional recommendations, expert opinions, etc. This, this are, let's say, is an extract of the uh, Stockholm consensus uh, that was mentioned before. And, and in this process, also EQA uh, plays an important role. And uh, I think uh, if this concept is established, we can make a step forward as well. I was challenged a little bit uh, this morning uh, by the discussion about uh, that in, in our EQA, we mainly focus on the analytical part of the process. But you have also the pre- and the post-analytical phase. And if you look in the ISO 15189 guideline, it says that, uh, in fact, the entire process should be covered by EQA program. And we also know that we can speak now, we speak nowadays about the pre-pre and the post-post analytical phase. So to my opinion, and I would like to add a new aspect of, uh, of, of the role of EQA and probably a new er, uh, area of harmonization we need, is that we should move from analytical performance assessment to what I call diagnostic performance assessment. That does not mean that it has to replace this completely, but we should go into that direction. And currently we have a project running from ECAT where we try to mimic this process. What we did is we present to the physician 
a patient case. That is an electronic survey. He has to uh, answer a, a certain amount of questions about uh, physical examination aspects and what he thinks about diagnosis. And he gets some uh, historical background information about this patient. In the same time, the laboratory has received a sample that is related to this patient. And we ask then the physician at a certain moment in the questionnaire, okay, if you would like to order now some laboratory test, please send the laboratory request form to the laboratory. They do the tests on, on the sample that ha they have received. They send the results to, to us as an EQA provider. And if there are tests ordered that are could not be performed in their own laboratory, they can include an expert laboratory as well. This is all reported to the ECAT. Then we, we, we prepare a next electronic questionnaire, which is sent to the physician again, including the lab results, reference ranges, etc., or reference <coughs> intervals, I have to say. Um, and uh, based on that, the physician can do the next step. Probably he come already to a final diagnosis and then the process is done and we can look at the whole process uh, if there are differences between the evaluation of the physicians as well as the analytical quality that was performed by the, by the laboratory. And in fact, if the physician said, okay, I need some additional laboratory tests, we can start again here at this level so this can go a couple of times around and with this we try to mimic more or less the entire diagnostic process so i cannot present yet uh, data on this because we, we start about one and a half week ago with this uh, with this project but i think it is a new challenge also for eqa providers to try to mimic as most as possible the diagnostic process of course there are disadvantages uh, also here, because you cannot include everything. Uh, for instance, um, let's say the blood collection and blood handling, that is not covered in, in, in this uh, process. But I, I think it adds new aspects to uh, EQA we did not use before. So, in conclusion, um, maybe EQA programs are probably as variable as between laboratory results we observe in our own programs as well. Information about the need for harmonization can be obtained from EQA service, assuming that the program is properly designed and that include at least commutable <coughs> samples. I think that is very important. EQA is an important player in the process of test harmonization EQA is not only a tool for quality assessment, but also a tool for quality improvement. So it, should, it, it is a part of the total quality management system. And the need for harmonization should be viewed in the perspective of the patient. So we, should, we don't have to do that only from a met meteorological point of view, but we should always keep the patient in mind. Thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a little bit of time for some comments and questions. I had one I was just thinking of, just as you were last speaking, you said, um, if the program is properly designed. So one of the things that you mentioned was accreditation to ISO 17043 is not the panacea, but that sets some guidelines about how the programs are designed and how they're operated. But, so how do we know if the program is properly designed? Yeah, that's, that, that's a very good question. And... Um, I think, uh, at least that, that is my opinion, that every EQA provider should be very clear about the design of their program, uh, what kind of samples they have included, how they do the statistical, and that should be open to everybody. So you, if you go to the website of an, an EQA provider, all that kind of information should be available. So that, that also laboratories can evaluate based on the information that is this the appropriate program that fulfilled to my needs. Next to that, 
uh, within the arena of EQA providers, we should think about why do we have these differences? Are they only historical based? And is there a manner that we can also harmonize the manner we have designed our mm -hmm. programs? That does not mean that I would say uh, that all the EQA programs should be equal or not. That depends also a little bit of the focus of, of the program. Good. In that, uh, and just as a note to, to everybody here, CLSI is now um, just about to renew and, and revise the document called GP27, which is about using proficiency, uh, using proficiency test men, uh, testing and external quality assessment for educational purposes and quality improvement purposes in the laboratory. And, I, and uh, so it's, it's open for revision. Anybody that's involved in CLSI um, and wants to sort of be an observer or an advisor in, in, in that uh, document, it might be a very interesting opportunity to start to add that in. I think many laboratories in the U.S. don't know what to look for in their EQA programs and their providers, often think of it as a regulatory activity, and it has become a regulatory activity so much in the U.S. So I think there's new opportunity there. And uh, go ahead, please, question. Comment. Thank you very much. Annemarie van Veen from the Netherlands. I would like to ask if you have experience with bad performance policies uh, with your EQI and with laboratories. And if so, what are the criteria that the EQI A program uh, should fulfill to make this possible? We have no uh, uh, fulfilled criteria. Uh, I don't understand your question. You, you mean that uh, there is a prerequisite for participating to AQE? No. At a certain moment, you see certain laboratory yes. continuously having a bad performance. Yeah. And um, there's discussion about uh, a bad performance policy for those mm -hmm. laboratories. What are you going to do with that data? And my question is um, that what are the criteria the program needs to... Uh, it depends on the, on the rules, <laughs> previously done. But uh, generally, uh, we have no, no closing of, uh, of laboratory. We are not you are only advices about uh, what should be done to correct the, the fact, mm -hmm. the errors. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, we, we have also not yet... Uh, let's say, completely defined criteria for that. We are just in the phase of discussing about that, how, how we can, what kind of criteria we can use to, uh, uh, to evaluate with, to that respect uh, participants and how we can inform them. Um, what we did uh, in our own program, that we also developed a model for what we call the long-term evaluation of EQA data for a particular participant. And uh, based on that model, you can calculate what we call uh, the long-term CV, the long-term imprecision, as well as the long-term bias. And we are looking now to, uh, to make also criteria based on the biological variation to relate this long-term CV and bias to uh, the criteria based on the, on the biological variation. If we can use that as a quality tool, quality indicator for the lab uh, to use if they fulfill the criteria there. But, but that is still under development. So Dr. Lefebvre, in, uh, in France, uh, with this mandatory accreditation scheme, is it, is it the thought that it will be that uh, continued poor performance in, in EQA um, could have an effect on the accreditation? Uh, probably no, because um, in fact, you, you, when, you, when you begin accreditation, you must, uh, you must have an EQA and you must realize it. But uh, for, for the moment, there is no uh, typical uh, criticism. If even you, you must make corrective action, you must collect this, this corrective action, but for the moment there is no uh, definitive uh, uh, sanction about uh, what, what could be done if, uh, if the, the lab is wrong. But uh, in fact, it's a general policy to implement quality, but uh, for the moment, no, nothing more than that. Okay. 
Thank you. Dr. Jones. Perhaps if I could just address that question from the Australian perspective, um, we have now over some years, um, starting with government initiative, asking us to try and identify poorly performing laboratories. The, the initial process was to set up, a, if you like, a global ranking based on all of the participation, review those in the bottom 5% by an expert review and look for typical failures like just transposing some data and then see if, if, those, if those at the bottom may be um, considered poor enough to submit onto the regulatory body. At the moment, as of last week, the, we, and we currently send that report out to all laboratories so they can see where they are in a global ranking. The openness was, was part of the policy. Um, we will not be passing it on to the accreditation bodies uh, due to mainly due to legal issues, but we feel that the first thing that we're doing is letting laboratories know that overall they're right at the bottom should really be looking at what they're what they're doing. Uh, perhaps still from Australian perspective, I could ask a question with regards to EQAS. Um, I had the pleasure to attend one of those meetings a couple of years ago, and to be in a, a room full of people interested in EQA was fantastic. Has there been any thought of of turning it into a global body? Um, you know, if we're talking about harmonisation, um, it is a, a global issue. Um, well, we had a lot of discussion about that in our last uh, equal meeting uh, in, in 2011. And I hope that it, that was the last uh, I could do for equal as a chair to bring it to a global organisation. Uh, unfortunately, we, we failed because, uh, well, most of the members are from, from Europe, and we know that there is more and more interest from outside Europe to participate in, 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 this, in this organization. And I think that is, that is good to open the borders and to have a broad view on what we can do on a global scale uh, from an EQA perspective. So I think... Um, uh, it, it will be a matter of time that Equom open uh, his, his uh, borders and change from Equom to Iquom. <laughs> and because I think that there is a need for that. And we, we should not be, uh, be afraid about that, that uh, let's say, the Australians or the, uh, the uh, US people take over. Uh, the the, uh, the initiatives that were taken in the past from from here from Europe, I think we should we should work together and and well th that is what I try also in my my presentation on several uh, levels we need harmonization even in how we organize our EQA programs. So from my perspective, you are very welcome. <laughs> Andy. I'm still not very convinced whether you're really testing the single lab, but whether you're really testing different IVD vendors. Because like making errors when you're handling the, the um, test, your, your samples, this, I think this is not the real lab world, what you're testing. Because normally not the lab director is handling the samples, but normally a technician. And I think in the, when, when you come to this um, external quality scheme, this is not handled by the regular technician. This is regulated by somebody else. And this is, I think this is the German perspective. So if we fail in the external quality scheme, this goes to the, uh, let's say, the federal office for IVD products. And if they see a certain company fail several times, the IVD company gets a problem. And if I fail several times, I'm getting not reimbursed. So it's... I think it's it's another way of going to the go, going to this process. Yes. No, in in, um, in my opinion, uh, quality control sample must, must be uh, handled by, uh, by by the same person like the plasma samples. Uh, so there is no uh, uh, when you receive a vial of quality control, you you, you do it like a, exactly like a, a patient sample. You have not the right to do uh, differently because, uh, as you say, this, this is not the same person, the same experiment, the same experience, the same touch to, to make the, 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 real, the, the real quality control. So um, it must be, uh, it, it is an external uh, quality uh, assessment that you, you, you must have the same person realizing 
realizing uh, your, uh, samples from patient and samples from quality control. It's, uh, in my opinion, it's mandatory. You know, you, uh, we all know that the vial and the tube is not the same. Okay, but uh, the, the, the behavior of uh, the sampling, uh, the, uh, the touch to do with that, the must be the same. May, may I ask you a question? Do you have an alternative? <laughs> you know, I'm questioning that you're making a very complicated scheme, like asking questions to the, uh, to the, to the patient and going back and going in this loop. And I think this, the idea is nice, but it's not the real world, the real world what you are checking. If, if I have a problem in my, in my lab, for example, if the reception of the, of the samples, this is not what I'm testing in your scheme. In this scheme, I'm calling you and asking you questions because you are the EQA um, office, you know? Yep. You know what I, I mean? It's yeah, I, I, I understand. And I think I mentioned already that we do not cover all the aspects of the entire process with this new, what I call then, diagnostic EQA. Uh, but at least we add up an, a number of aspects that are not included in our regular EQA programs up to now. And uh, of course it is, it, it is not the <laughs> ideal situation and we should keep in mind that we miss probably some important aspects, but we have to look then for other uh, approaches where we can probably cover that as well. Uh, so this, is, this will be not the end stage, but it is at least a step, a next step. And, and uh, we will see how it works out and how we can improve in the future further with this type of EQA. I was very, uh, very encouraged by the, the concept there, and it, it brought me back to this morning, the very first session this morning, and Dr. Goldschmidt said, uh, QC providers can think about expanding into the pre-analytic and post-analytic and things like that. So as you're talking about the entire testing process, it's, it's, a, it's a novel concept. I know that some of that happens in the, uh, pathology, the cytopathology, histopathology world, and they're looking at that as well, but it's a little different. So we'll move on to the next. One last question? Okay. Oh, okay, we'll move on to... Uh